Hi, everyone. It's Orville Thomas. I just want to make sure that everyone can hear me. Thumbs up. My name is Orville Thomas, and I have the honor of being the Director of Government Affairs for the California Immigrant Policy Center. Thank you to everyone for participating in our 2020 Immigrant Day of Action that is going exactly as we had planned all those months ago. And now we have this nice digital campaign to make sure that we have our voices heard and that we have interaction with our legislative representatives. Uh, I get to moderate the three o'clock panel on census getting counted during COVID-19. I think all our panelists are on and I have a chance to introduce them. I want to first introduce the policy and research analyst from the Advancement Project, Alejandra Ramirez Zarate. Next up, we have the Census Campaign Manager from Churla, Esperanza Guevara. And finally, our Director of Advocacy for Chinese for Affirmative Action, Hong Mei Peng. Thank you three so much for being part of our census work and our panel. You know, I've had a chance to work with all three of you on different census outreach throughout the year. And I'm really looking forward to this conversation around where census goes in coordination with the response to the COVID-19 pandemic. So my first question, I wanna start with Alejandra. You know, we've had a chance to work with many organizations in California. Can you talk about the background on what the effort had been to make sure every Californian was counted this year uh, prior to the COVID-19 outbreak? And then we could start really discussing the pivot that a lot of our organizations have had to make uh, mm -hmm. regarding the outbreak and how that changes the way we ask people to interact with the census. Yes, hi Orville and hi everyone. Happy to be with you all. I'm super excited about census. I'm so passionate to be here in this space with you discussing the importance of the census. So uh, let's go ahead and get started. So uh, to your question, um, the landscape before census was one where uh, the state of California had invested 187 million into census outreach. And this also included collaborating with CPOs, local grassroots organizations, uh, local governments, elected officials, and businesses, right? Just sort of this really great coordination, um, collaboration, leaning into the strength that we all possess. And CBOs having that access to our communities, being trusted messengers, we're really positioned to start uh, engaging with residents on the importance of the census. Many of them had started uh, implementing their outreach tactics, bringing it into the fold of their other campaigns like GOTV and campaign work, right? So it was one where uh, it was really understood that census is not political because a good census is good for everyone, and but particularly more so for our communities, for low income communities of color, for immigrants. And it was great to lean into that going into this work. I mean, this is work that we've been uh, having since 2017, maybe earlier, right? The sort of the planning and the collaboration and the different coalitions, right? So, and now we've had to transition over to uh, COVID, right? 19 and that landscape, there have been many uh, policy changes coming from the Bureau, including the extension um, uh, to respond to October 31st. So that's not something we like to necessarily promote. We want folks to respond right now. We want folks to be counted, to receive the benefits and resources that they deserve because there's strength in our numbers, right? So we have now transitioned to completely digital. Um, we are relying on our community partners, our great CBOs uh, on the ground who from home, right? Because we are safer at home right now and uh, continue to be so. That's the case as we start to reopen our state and our uh, localities, whatever that slow phase looks like. We want everyone, all of our organizers to be safe. So we are increasing visibility of the census by having signs. I don't know if many of you have seen uh, in various uh, signs out there on trash cans, on the, the garbage uh, uh, trucks, right? And freeway signs. So increasing visibility of the census. And, and of course, digital. And uh, I'll 
uh, look to my colleague Esperanza, a wonderful colleague at Chima, to talk about more about their uh, tactics on deep phone banking. But many of our partners are relying on deep phone banking, right? And having that uh, serve uh, that relationship that they have with community residents serve as a catapult for lifting up census messaging because we're also mindful that census for many folks is not at the forefront of their mind. We are mindful and respectful that many of our communities are facing unemployment. Uh, quite frankly, fighting for their lives if they're on ventilators, right? And we know that our uh, historically undercounted communities are more likely to be affected by COVID, either because of, of the virus itself or any of the other implications like unemployment, right? So we are mindful that census is not necessarily priority for the folks that are most likely to be undercounted. So we're weaving in different tactics to ensure that these folks are counted. So that's just a little bit of what we're doing right now. Uh, thank you, Alejandra. And I want to pivot to Esperanza. She talked about the phone banking. You know, what, what is it like right now where people have so many things on their mind and are experiencing so many other like circumstances to get people to reconsider the census and making sure that they're filling these out? Thank you so much, Orville and, and Alejandra, for you know just being great partners in this work. Um, just to kind of take it a couple steps back, you know, um, we so Chila was contracted by the state to do outreach to immigrants, refugees. Uh, limited English proficient individuals. Um, and we've also partnered with organizers on the campaign Contamos Contigo in April of last year. And at the time, uh, we were waiting to hear back um, on how the Supreme Court was going to decide on um, the citizenship question uh, on the census form. And as we know that um, as we know, justice prevailed and uh, a question on citizenship wasn't, was not included on the census form. Um, but our work has not gotten any easier since then. And um, so it's been definitely a journey um, since, since last year, uh, as we've been doing a lot of this outreach work. Um, there's different legs for sure to our, uh, our census outreach efforts. Um, you know, when we were able to pre-COVID-19, uh, times we uh, were doing one-to-one -one conversations out in the field with census community liaisons. Uh, we reached over 10,000 individuals um, through this, uh, this team, over 30,000 individuals through our organizing team. Um, we did have phone banking uh, occurring throughout this time as well, and we're able to reach over 100,000 individuals. Um, but yes, it's, it's, uh, there's definitely been a lot of shifts with the way that uh, we're doing our outreach now even just uh, on an operational uh, level to have um, our canvassers uh, switch over to phone banking uh, was required to like, give our, phone, our, our call center uh, phone, uh, phone operators do um, remote phone banking also required uh, training and transition. And so um, it's, it's definitely, uh, like I said, uh, it's been a journey to um, do outreach in, in, this, in these new times and to find, uh, highlight the relevance and importance of census um, when people are grappling with so, so many other, um, you know, uh, pressing issues like the loss of jobs, um, uh, worries about their health. Um, but yes, the, the work has continued uh, dur definitely during these conversations, during um, our, our phone banking efforts. We, we do make sure to provide individuals with a list of resources, first and foremost, if, if they are directly impacted or know folks who are impacted um, by COVID-19. And so we have that information available for, for individuals. We, we make sure to highlight, to connect how the census, again, continues to be relevant uh, during this, these times because of um, how uh, federally funded programs like unemployment insurance, um, the coronavirus relief fund, all of that, um, we remind folks, ties back to a an accurate census count. Um, there are cities who, um, who did not qualify to access, for example, um, funding through the coronavirus relief fund or through the CARES Act. 
um, that had population uh, populations under 500,000. And so, um, you know, the census is very much relevant, uh, especially during these times. And it's, it, it becomes our job to really um, um, use conversations with folks to, uh, to walk them through those steps so that, um, you know, folks realize that connection between census and your daily, the, the quality, um, you know, daily quality of life issues. Um, and then also then go beyond that and actually help individuals to completing their census forms. And, and so again, obstacles continue. Uh, we continue facing obstacles in, in um, at every point during that, I would say. Uh, would have, um, what we try to do is help them complete their uh, their form right then and there. Um, and uh, the online option is in some cases the best option for folks. Um, we've, um, and I'll, I'll walk through a little bit uh, on that later as well, uh, because not everyone has internet access at home or um, is able to complete the form on, on their own for whatever reason. And so we, we do have a strategy for, a, a tactic for reaching those folks. Um, but, but we do find that the internet option is the, is the quickest way and a lot of times to provide that assistance when you have someone on, on the phone with you. Um, what sometimes happens uh, with, um, with, with individuals who can't, even after we let them know, hey, um, you know, you can fill out the form outline, is uh, a couple of different things. So if we do, when we have attempted to uh, connect individuals um, to the hotline operator um, from the Census Bureau, we have encountered um, just long wait times and, uh, and, and dropped calls. So there's an issue there that, that is still sort of being uh, um, worked out and that we're trying to uplift with, with our allies in, in Congress and directly to the Census Bureau as well and through our coalition, <clears throat> coalition partner spaces as well. Um, and so, um, so that, you know, that presents a, just another obstacle, right, for, for, for some of our community members. Um, if, if an individual doesn't feel comfortable filling out the form um, online or, you know, we, like as I just described, they aren't, aren't able to fill it out um, by calling the Census Bureau directly to complete it through, their, um, through the Census Bureau hotline, um, in, in that case, then we, we remind folks, if, they, uh, if we remind folks um, that we have on the call, that we can actually, that although we're not Census Bureau employees and we aren't bound by the same data confidentiality protections that a Census Bureau employee would be, um, uh, that we can, uh, we do, we can and we do end up assisting them directly or on our end will actually um, go to my2020census.gov and, um, and, and help assist the caller with completing, uh, completing their form online. I'm sorry, I'm getting a, a message that my internet connection is, is unstable, so I hope that you, you heard all of that. But um, yeah, so that was, that's sort of a, a snapshot of how our work has, has looked like. Um, doing outreach during these times for, um, you know, during COVID-19. Um, and then, you know, I'll, I'd love to bring up some of the other more creative uh, ways where we're, we're still trying to raise awareness about the sense later on as well, but I'll, I'll give back some of my time. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Esperanza. Yeah, and your, your audio is off and on, so I think it might be helpful if you used one of the dial-in numbers to call in, and then maybe you could just communicate with Sandhya as to what that number is going to be, and then she could unmute you and place you back on the panel. But thank you. Uh, Hung Mei, thank you for joining us. Can you talk to us about the background of Chinese for Affirmative Action and Census and why it's an important um, kind of opportunity for the organization and for the community and kind of the work that you've been leading uh, in coordination? Yeah, thank you so much, Orville, and to the entire California Immigrant Policy Center um, for your tenacity, really, in pulling this year's Immigrant Day together um, and for having us on this panel. Um, you know, I think just by way of background, a little bit about Chinese for Affirmative Action, we are a 51-year-old uh, civil rights community-based organization headquartered in San Francisco, Chinatown, and our mission is to defend and protect the civil and political rights of Chinese Americans and to advance a multiracial democracy. And core to our mission 
um, is really the census. Uh, we um, have worked on the decennial census since the 1970s, um, and this encompasses a broad range of uh, different strategies, uh, including advocating for policy and investments from state and local governments. We do have an office that is based in Sacramento where our legislative director leads our statewide advocacy work. And we um, have really appreciated the partnership of all the other panelists this, this time around uh, to really be able to, I think, Wait, um, make I'm sure may, that I, the appropriate- Really quickly, can the, the interpreters are asking if we can slow down on the conversation uh, just yeah. to give them time to listen and then interpret for our audience. Thank you. Um, and I'm so sorry I had to just cut in between there, uh, but I want to make sure that everyone has a chance to listen to what you're saying. No worries. Um, thank you so much for flagging that. I am still getting used to the virtual interface. So please do let me know if you need me to slow down somewhere. Um, and, you know, I think part of the work that we have been doing um, is really to be able to address not just on the investment piece, um, as we have done with our partners, um, but also to be able to remove barriers and motivate particip participation of our hard to count populations um, during every census. Um, specifically, we have uh, worked within the Asian Pacific Islander communities and Based on the American Community Survey, um, you know, about 20% of fifths of California's population identify as API, Asian Pacific Islander. And this community is extremely diverse. Um, this crosses the range of national origin, the languages they are spoken, immigration patterns, uh, cultural and political conceptions around civic engagement and the civic process and how they have come into contact uh, with being a participant in um, a democracy. And so ever since the beginning of our Census 2020 advocacy, dating back to um, you know, 2018, we have recognized that um, you know, this is going to be one of the most technically challenging census for our communities. For AAPIs in particular, for Asian American and Pacific Islanders in particular, um, there are multiple barriers at participating in the census, and they are still relevant today, even within the COVID-19 era. Um, it crosses the realm of language access, and this is due to our diversity. There is really no one-size-fits-all formula that would be able to um, solve the issue around how diverse um, you know, the needs are in our community related to language access. Um, the Census Bureau is doing things a little differently this time around, even though they are making digital forms available in English and 12 other languages. Um, there are no paper forms available this time for a majority of um, non-English language speaking communities. Um, and, you know, for, from what we understand, um, this contributes directly and overlays with the issue around the digital divide. Um, seniors, people in working class families, who do not have reliable internet access would default to phone lines, which we have also learned, similar to our partners at Churla, that um, it has not been reliable. Uh, it has been a very clunky operation from the Census Bureau side, long wait times, tattling over two hours, um, and drop calls. Um, and you know what ends up happening is community-based organizations become the centerpiece for bridging some of the gaps. Uh, for not simply uh, helping people dial in and access existing access points for, for, provided by the Census Bureau, but really to be able to translate and provide support for non-English language speaking communities. And, you know, we are operating in a very dizzying climate. Um, federally, um, even though immigration policies um, continue to worsen, um, the, the ways that Southeast Asian and refugee communities are disproportionately also impacted by deportation policies um, are staggering. Um, and, you know, the administration is going after pretty much everybody who it doesn't deem to be, you know, um, I guess immigrants from Switzerland or, you know, Sweden. Um, green card holders are even going back into the shadows. Naturalized citizens are afraid to access uh, public services because of expanded public charge rules. And this is the context that we would have been navigating um, if it was just census 2020. And so since the outbreak with COVID-19 and the pandemic, uh, we have been 
ushered into a completely new day for census implementation. Demographically speaking, hard to count communities overlay directly almost with all those who are hit the hardest by COVID-19. These are communities of color, working class people, seniors, um, and you know, I think new, newly arrived immigrants. And COVID-19 is really revealing similar gaps in our social safety nets as we have learned from census 2020 planning. The importance of something like language access in people's ability to get healthcare economic relief and even social services during this time um, speaks volume to the work that we have ahead of us um, from a systems and public policy perspective. Um, but COVID-19 has also forced us to completely overhaul our approach to um, shelter in place mandates because of shelter in place mandates. Um, we have had to cope uh, with upending, uh, completely doing away with key strategies as it relates to in-person outreach. Uh, oh, we have had slow, to- Slow it down again, please. Okay. We have had to really encourage people to participate um, through large, you know, I think avoiding large scale event, we've had to encourage people to participate um, through virtual and phone-based um, strategies, right? So um, ever since shelter in place went into effect, we have as an organization, phone bank to over 1,100 families in language. And we have leveraged new strategies such as Chinese social media, um, instituted things like raffles. Um, one little anecdote is before we went into shelter in place, we received like thousands of census 2020 hand sanitizers in our offices. And so now we're trying to raffle those out <laughs> before, you know, um, we actually um, go back into the office. So there's this whole raffle process happening. Um, but we're really trying to engage with, um, you know, traditional ethnic media partners, because that is how our community is receiving information. Um, you know, we know that the Bureau is doing its best to do walkthroughs of the census form through paid media segments. And we're just trying to get the word out um, through all the various forms that we have. Um, and, you know, I think for us, uh, the shift in COVID-19 um, and the sort of, um, you know, the, the sort of presence of COVID-19 news um, and need for access to relief and aid is very natural. Um, and, you know, we are also trying to mirror our messaging um, really to say to our communities, you know, the road to recovery is long and it requires all of us to make a difference now because the, the resources that we have for the next 10 years um, to recover from something like COVID-19 requires us to really participate in the census right now as it relates to healthcare, nutrition, and education. But specifically, because the Bureau has shifted its operations to an extended timeline, we're also doing a lot of messaging work to counteract any fraud that might be occurring right now. Um, com communicating in factual information to our communities, making sure that People don't fall prey to scams that might exist. Um, you know, I think that we've heard people um, reporting that uh, there are Census Bureau impersonators um, who are taking advantage of the chaos in the moment uh, to conduct, you know, I think um, scams and fraud. Uh, we are trying to be able to address to that in real time through the different communications channels that we have. Um, and it has really forced us to reconfigure our approach to implementation. There are so many local efforts aim at providing essential services, whether if it's food banks, food drops, um, you know, um, providing different uh, employment services. We're trying to piggyback off of these local efforts uh, so that census 2020 is still out there, we're still keeping it alive, and really to be able to communicate with the Bureau on gaps that exist, right, about the phone, um, lines being backed up, and really to try to advocate and establish a line of communication um, as they begin to ramp back up and anticipating continued partnership um, in the post shelter in place kind of era. And I'm gonna sort of uh, punctuate my comments there and pass it back up on to Orville. Thank you, thank you so much. And thank you three for starting us off on this conversation. I wanna be respectful of the audience is time and they're starting to ask some questions. So I'm going to throw a general question out there. And if you feel that you um, 
have an opportunity to answer it, then please, please raise your hand and I will uh, jump right to you. There was one question that came in specifically not about the language barrier as much as it's larger, what is happening to address the larger disability community and how can we make sure that there is access to our community members? Get started and then um, fellow panelists can fill in. So uh, there are efforts uh, by the state of California um, by funding organizations that advocate on behalf of um, and work with uh, folks that have disabilities. And that work has been ongoing. There have been new agreements that have been made uh, in an effort to make sure that those entities that have the those relationships and knowledge of the challenges and the barriers uh, with accessing census uh, and even just responding to the census, right? Or even communicating the importance of uh, the census to folks with disabilities. Uh, they are positioned best to work with these communities, right? So the state has been intentional in funding these groups, making sure that they have what they need. And at the local level, this, uh, this includes um, LA County work, uh, I can speak on. Uh, the California Community Foundation has been positioned as the administrative CDO in our region, which is considered Region 8 by the state of California. And they are funding and have funded groups that are working with folks experiencing disabilities that have disabilities to ensure that they have, again, the, the funding that they need, the resources that may be needed to reach out to this community. And it's so like uh, Hong Mei uh, was uh, sharing with us, it's so complex already, right? Even before pre-COVID-19, uh, reaching out to folks as it is. Then you add the challenge of uh, COVID-19 and reaching folks who uh, have disabilities. And it's definitely uh, one of our uh, areas where we see more challenges because uh, those disabilities are nuanced. Not everybody will have a visible disability as well, right? So it's uh, something our partners have been uh, advocating for, something we continue to elevate to elected officials and to funders to ensure that these groups are well positioned to do that uh, outreach. Thank you. Um, Esperanza, we have a question from the audience. Um, and Sandhya, can I ask you to unmute our, our audience member? Rosa, if you are hearing this, we just unmuted you so you can ask your question. That's Rosa Acosta. Um, she just sent the question into the chat. I don't know. Si. Sí. Perfect. Aquí estoy. Si me escuchan? Si. Sí. Okay. Si me escuchan? Si, sí, si. Sí. Okay. Creo... <laughs> Hello? Sí, Rosa. Oh, okay. Hi. No, no se ve. Um, puedes, puedes hacer su pregunta ahora. Sí. Yeah. Mi pregunta es cómo poder ayudar como organización aquí en San Pablo, California, a las personas que no saben leer ni escribir, personas discapacitadas, uh, tengo una clienta que tiene el corona, ¿verdad? Virus y tiene dos niños, es mamá soltera y, y tiene un niño de 13 y de 6 años. ¿Cómo poder ayudarlos? Están hablando, yo sé, de, de no nomás del coronavirus, sino también están hablando de las encuestas, todo esto, y no saben leer ni escribir. Yo como comunidad aquí en San Pablo, ¿cómo puedo yo ayudarles? Es más, tengo mi hermana que es especial y su hija que es especial. Y 
y ellas no, no tienen este, este, este servicio. Gracias, Rosa. Um, respond, uh, ro should I respond in Spanish or in English? Um, what, uh, I'm going to respond in Spanish and then perhaps someone can translate. Um, gracias, Rosa, por, por su pregunta. Este, nosotros um, somos una organización de, um, de varias que están haciendo este trabajo uh, para hacer alcance sobre el censo. Um, nosotros nos, uh, como Chilas, uh, nos, estamos enfocados en regiones específicas para uh, hacer el alcance directo a, a comunidades um, que, con las que trabajamos um, para da, proveer la información sobre el censo y proveer asistencia para llenar los formularios. Um, uh, pero también hay otras organizaciones como NALEO, como uh, the Lati uh, Latino Community Foundation, uh, que igual también tienen uh, recursos um, para organizaciones um, para dar esta información sobre el censo. Así que si Chile no es, uh, tiene presencia en, en su ciudad específicamente, también uh, hay otras organizaciones que uh, podrían um, proveer uh, esta información o apoyo. Lo que también hemos um, estado viendo, ya que las estamos viendo la, la, los datos, um, la, cómo están respondiendo en diferentes lugares en el, el estado, y estamos viendo la necesidad de hacer más alcance en diferentes áreas en California. Uh, sí, estamos, en, estamos platicando más con nuestros, um, uh, con, con diferentes organiz, organizaciones, tal vez como la suya, para ver cómo podemos ayudar si es uh, dando, por ejemplo, capacitación o simplemente um, 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 dándole también uh, nuestros recursos, nuestra, nuestras presentaciones, um, si es por webinar, por ejemplo, um, o, o, o por ejemplo, videos que hemos grabado, dando la información en español e inglés sobre el censo para que podamos compartir los recursos que tenemos ahorita con, con usted. Entonces, um, ¿puedo dejar mi correo electrónico aquí en el chat box? Oh, okay. ya veo que, que sí. usted me acaba de mandarlo. Um, pero sí, nos podemos conectar después de esta presentación para que yo bueno. le pueda compartir la, los, uh, los recursos que yo tengo o que Chila ha, uh, um, ha desarrollado para hacer bueno. este, dar esta información a nuestras comunidades. Y, y, pero aparte también tenemos, um, como le repito, hay otras organizaciones que también están uh, proveyendo esta, uh, est estos recursos y, y también puedo dar, darte los datos de, uh, de, de ellos también. Ok, gracias. Gracias, gracias por, por contestarme mis preguntas. Creo que escribí mucho. Creo que soy la única que escribí, pero eh, me interesa mucho poder ayudar a mi comunidad, eh, ya que hay personas pues que no, no leen, no escriben y sobre todo también no contestan número de teléfonos que, que no los reconocen, entonces no contestan. A veces les digo, tienen que contestar porque puede ser una llamada importante. No, pero aquí la comunidad realmente la conozco, 35 años que trabajo aquí, uh, tienen mucho temor de contestar números de teléfono que no lo conocen. Entonces creo que por intermedio mío de mi organización puede ser más fácil trabajar juntos con ustedes y decir a mi comunidad, sí pueden contestar ese número de teléfono. Eso es todo. Gracias. Está muy bueno todo el entrenamiento y aquí todo lo que están hablando, se los agradezco mucho, mucho. Y este programa Zoom es lo mejor. A veces tengo tres reuniones al día de diferentes lugares. Se los agradezco a todos, su tiempo, uh, su esfuerzo y su dedicación a la comunidad. Gracias. De parte de Morada de Mujeres del Milenio. Y, y Rosa, quería agregarle, um, pero solo voy a decir en inglés para que todos me entiendan. So okay. I just wanted to add uh, quickly, um, and then um, the translators can, uh, or the interpreters can interpret for me so everybody can understand. Uh, I wanted to add that there are organizations, uh, as Esperanza mentioned, that uh, target specifically and work specifically with folks with disabilities. And one of them includes Disability Rights Education and Defense Fund. Um, and they uh, are well positioned and well resourced to do this kind of outreach to folks with disabilities. So 
I just want to make the quick plug in for them because they would be a great partner uh, for resources specifically uh, for folks with disabilities. Um, and I'm happy to include their information and they have all sorts of resources and knowledge that uh, it would be great to connect with them. Thank you guys. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, really quickly, I want to ask a couple of just uh, quick, quick questions that address some of our uh, questions and comments. You know, and we'll start with Hong Mei. Prior to COVID, the concern was that California would already lose a congressional seat because of underrepresentation, undercounting. How are we doing before the pandemic? did hit and really affect the way that everyone uh, did their outreach? Yeah, I think, you know, we have planned for a lot of the outreach to happen in person during large scale events. Um, and all those things are out the window. We know that even after shelter in place that we will not be going back to normal immediately. And so we have to really rely and bank on some of the technologies that we're employing in this particular census. Um, when we have mapping tools like SWORD, like Roam, um, we can really employ and maximize the usage of the data that we're getting. Because what, and this is sort of a hypothesis, um, but it will likely reveal to us that the communities and geographies that are the hardest to count are also the hardest hit by COVID-19. Which means that you know, when we resume to in-person outreach, um, to be able to address the multiple barriers at people's ability to participate. Um, we have to also marry that and also in tandem with COVID relief and recovery efforts that are happening on the local front, um, especially for seniors, residents, people living in non-traditional housing and overcrowded households, um, new, new, newly arrived immigrants, limited English proficient um, you know, households. And really what we're thinking and seeing is that you know, hyper local approaches are absolutely necessary in driving up self response. We have and we will continue to see that whether or not we win at the decennial census comes down to the track level. Because what we have seen since, um, you know, uh, self response really opened up in January in places even like Alaska, that if you segment the data regionally, you see disparity even within the region, right? So there is a huge diversity in how each locality is responding or not responding to the census. Um, and we have to pay attention to census tracts that have the most diverse demographics. And for us in the AAPI communities, uh, as you're thinking about, you know, more traditional enclaves like Chinatown, we are also starting to resettle in neighborhoods that are more diverse alongside other hard to count communities. It requires intentional, multilingual and cross-racial approaches, many of which we're implementing on the ground locally. Um, and we want to be able to partner with other community-based organizations to provide in-person questionnaire assistance. Uh, we've trained over 500 providers in the San Francisco Bay Area to be able to navigate that tricky terrain that some of our other panelists were talking about. Um, but, you know, I think I just wanted to kind of also point to the fact that as much as it is an imperfect uh, science, uh, we have to be as a state ready for imputation um, and what that means for California. And for those of you who might not know what imputation is, it's basically the statistical way that the Bureau would uh, make an inference of how many people are actually living in, at a given place based on administrative records. Um, and this could be, you know, um, based on social security records or, you know, other things. And we know that this is not the best way to get a complete and accurate picture because hard to count populations are underrepresented in administrative records where the data will get pulled. But this is the default for the Census Bureau. And if there's anything that we've learned working on the census, whether if it's planning, advocacy, implementation, we have to be able to get ahead of the conversation so that the records are uh, accurate, they are complete, not just on the federal level, but also on the state and local levels as well. Thank you. Uh, my next question from the audience is going to be to Esperanza. And it's a follow up on something you said. And if you guys can see me on the screen, if I'm going like this, that means we're getting a request to slow down a little bit. So please make sure that you could see my screen um, as you're talking, uh, you know, the technology that we're adjusting to. You mentioned the Census Bureau hotline. 
one of our um, attendees has asked if you know the languages that are included on the Census Bureau hotline. Yes, uh, there are, um, I believe it's tw 12 different languages um, uh, that the, the hotline is actually available in. And um, I can actually send out the, um, the different numbers through the chat box. So I'll, I'll send it out um, right now. I'll just do a quick copy and paste uh, into the chat box so that folks have the, those different um, um, hotline languages available right there too, okay. if that helps. And then, and then just to circle back really quickly to the question you had asked previously, Orville, uh, Orville um, because I wanted to use it as an opportunity to do a quick plug for an upcoming event. <laughs> um, we had, um, you know, as part of our outreach efforts on the census, um, we had planned uh, towards the end of April to do um, a census, a census and civic engagement uh, focused or themed concert. Um, uh, you know, and and so ha having like music, music and TV personalities present, and so after the stay-at-home orders were implemented and and we couldn't do mass gatherings anymore, um, uh, obviously that those plans went out the window. Um, but our team actually was able to um, to bounce back from that, and we now have um, are still planning to do the concert. Uh, however, it will be a virtual concert. Uh, and it's coming up on May 23rd. It's called Cuídate y Cuéntate, the Spanish for take care of yourself and count yourself. So obviously incorporating the theme, um, you know, incorporating messaging and resources for folks who do tune in and, and, and participate on, uh, on um, you know, if you're impacted by COVID-19 um, and then bringing it back to, again, why it's so important for our communities to be counted in, in, in this census. Uh, so stay tuned. Uh, I hope that folks are, uh, can join. And if you're interested in collaborating, again, the concert will be on May 23rd. And, um, and, and that's all. <laughs> Thank you. And I want to have my last question go to Alejandra. Can you briefly, briefly just describe the CPAN network and then also how all the, the groups in that network have managed to coordinate um, in a environment that has included uh, public charge, that has included, you know, some tech difficulties and then also some barriers to access that are physical and what you guys as a group and a collective uh, have been doing to coordinate efforts. Yeah, definitely. Uh, super excited to talk about uh, CPAN, the Census Policy Advocacy Network, uh, of which uh, CIPC and Chile are both a member of. We are now 22 organizations. And this is a coalition that formed in 2017. And this is a group that has met monthly uh, and more often as needed. Uh, we've uh, switched over to uh, bi-weekly calls as needed during uh, the legislative session to ensure that we were advocating for funding, adequate funding for census, and to ensure that the state of California was hearing directly from the organizations on the ground, like your amazing organizations who have a direct insight and knowledge of our hardest to kill communities. So, We've been working together, uh, again, to influence policy at the state level. It's strictly a policy work that has had a great impact. We'd like to think that the 187.2 million that the state of California invested uh, was uh, partially due to our efforts, right? And this is an entity that continues to be responsive to changing uh, policy uh, and challenges not just at the state level, but uh, also nationally, we're responsive at the national level uh, to whatever the needs are on the policy front. And it, yes, you're right. It's been challenging to me virtually. Um, most of these folks that we work with, uh, we've only met uh, in person once. We meet in person once a year, uh, but that speaks volumes to the importance of collaboration, even through Zoom, because like I said, we've been meeting for years through Zoom and it's been highly successful. Um, and this is a coalition that's responsive to the needs of not just the community-based organizations that we work with, but community residents, right? What we're hearing on the ground is what we elevate to the state of California. And we've, again, it's been years, it's been highly successful. Uh, 
I'd like to think that that was a precursor to many of the uh, field operations that are happening now. And that was years ago. It is something that um, we wanted to be responsive to because we know that a good census is particularly good for historically undercounted communities um, and folks of color. And for me, the racial equity lens that we bring as a coalition is important because our low income folks of color, those are the folks that are primarily affected by this. And that's been largely the focus of CPAN. And I'll say that um, as someone who grew up undocumented myself, that work to see that level of work and in, in collaboration in service of folks like me, who you won't find in the database, right to Hong May's point, you won't find me on any database. Uh, maybe now, since I have a, a, a green card, uh, the government has my information, but other than that, I'm not on a voter file, I'm not anywhere. So how do you do outreach to folks like me uh, who also don't fit the mold of what someone documented looks like, right? So it's been beautiful to see folks like everybody on this call advocating for someone like me. It's a beautiful thing to see that people care. Um, and it's it's hard not to go back into the shadows, right? That was so powerful, Hung May. Uh, it's tempting to not be visible, to not be counted in a census because that's what we're taught to do, to remain invisible. But I am I'm not just a number, but you know what? My presence in this country counts. And so that's the work that CPAN has been doing. And again, to be able to, for me to bring in my lived experience to that policy work alongside great advocates like everybody on this call has been a beautiful thing. Thank you so much. I feel, I feel like that's a great way to end the uh, panel. For our esteemed panelists, thank you. Could you please put your uh, emails, if you so desire, and contact information in the chat box so that people might be able to email you and get a hold of you if they have further questions? Uh, I will kind of give it up for our interpreters. Thank you.